we've learned about um, RNA, RNA seq, some background. We've learned about library construction, how to gener generate the sequences. Um, uh, now we get to uh, the, 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 the important part where we take the sequences and we do some alignments and visualization. So in, in this uh, module, the focus is to look at some of the challenges that uh, we face when we deal with RNA-seq alignments. Uh, what are some of the alignment strategies that are available out there? We will be focusing on uh, bow tie and top hat and go over how these tools uh, work. Um, and then I'll, after that, I'll go over the output files from the alignments. Uh, so, the, so the BAM and the BED formats. For those of you who are not familiar with uh, those formats, we'll, we'll go through the formats, what, the, uh, what they look like, uh, and how you can manipulate them, and what you can do with them uh, to do further downstream analysis. And the final part will be alignment QC. So we have talked about uh, QC at uh, various points in this pipeline. So we've talked about uh, QC at the library construction level when we talked about RINs. Uh, we also talked about QC at the FASTQ level where you're assessing the sequences themselves to see how they were sequenced. Uh, but here we're going to be looking at post alignment. So after you align, after you figure out where these sequences are coming from in the genome, uh, we can do a lot more QC assessment at that level. So I'll give you some examples of some QC metrics that you can look at to assess uh, the quality of your sample and to give you more information and some biological information about the sample that you're, you're looking at. Now, uh, when it comes to RNA-seq alignment, uh, there are, we, we face a few challenges. So some of these challenges include the computational cost. Uh, and this topic was touched upon uh, 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 multiple times today, uh, but uh, each lane of sequencing, uh, again, depending on what kind of uh, sequencer you use, but if you're using, for example, HiSeq high 2500, uh, a lane of sequencing can generate 300, 400 million reads, and usually you do one to two samples per lane. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of reads that you're going to have to take and align to the genome. So that process is actually computationally uh, expensive because you will need, uh, just like we're doing today, you're going to need some uh, computational uh, uh, instances uh, such as Amazon. And the process is also time consuming. And not only that, but the amount of data you generate, there's a lot of data. You get alignments, you get fusions, uh, so you have a lot of files that you have to store and, and uh, the footprint is uh, a lot more here compared to other data types such as DNA. Um, when, when it comes to alignment as well, we, we get to deal with introns, so these are large gaps that the aligner has to recognize. These are things that uh, aligners uh, in DNA sequencing, they don't have to deal with these large intronic gaps when you try to map them back to the whole genome, but you, they have to consider when you're dealing with RNA-seq data. Um, also, the uh, Sometimes you ask, if I run it once, will I be done? No, there are a lot of updates that happen to the reference, a lot of updates that happen to the gene annotation. Uh, there are a lot of tools that come out that will look at uh, different aspects of the RNA-seq data. So chances are you, you will go back and reprocess your data multiple times depending on uh, what, how many updates happen and how long your project uh, is going for. Now, when it comes to uh, the RNA-seq map, uh, mapping tools, uh, you can classify them into three different categories. So there is the de novo assembly tools. You have the uh, tools where you align to transcriptome reference and tools that you align to a whole genome reference. Um, so what strategy is best? Now, that depends on what data you have and what you're trying to achieve. So, for example, if you do not have a, a, a reference or you don't, your reference is not sequenced, then you tend to do de novo assembly. So there are tools that will uh, do that for you. Uh, you also tend to do de novo assembly if there is a lot of complexity uh, or a polymorphism in your data, uh, data set and you don't want to force force it into uh, a reference. So we talked about variations, we talked about how the, the reference is only representing uh, certain genomes, uh, and you don't want to uh, force your variations into that one, 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 one genome, uh, you can go ahead and do a de novo assembly, because that, uh, um, that will deal with the complex polymorphisms. Uh, you can also, what you can also do, there are tools that will align to the transcriptome. So uh, these are references that 
will have all the possible combinations of transcripts and isoforms in the genome and you're simply just taking your mRNA or cDNA and you're trying to map it back to the transcriptome without having to deal with um, uh, assembling uh, the transcripts or isoforms. But the most popular type of aligners are the ones where you get to take the cDNA and try to align it back to the whole genome reference and do some sort of an uh, assembly of the, of the isoforms. And again, each one of these strategies, it comes with a complex and, and a set of tools and packages uh, that you can uh, uh, try. Now, in terms of tool, here's just a, a, a timeline of uh, all the different uh, aligners that are available out there and when they were uh, developed. And the ones that are uh, for RNA-seq, they are highlighted in red. And then this is uh, 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 20, 2015, so it's, uh, it's Pretty, pretty recent, and you can see that there are so many different tools that are being developed every year, uh, di different aligners uh, to be more specific. And for this workshop, we have decided to uh, uh, pick two tools. So we're doing top hat, and I don't know if we have time to do star. Uh, uh, the commands are available. Um, now top hat is uh, a bit more established. It's been in, uh, in, in the community for, for a while. And I, I like to start with, we like to start with top hat because because of the fact that it's very established and it's user friendly, there's a big community out there. So the likelihood that if you run into a problem, if you have a question, uh, most likely that it's actually been answered. Someone else has, uh, has faced that problem. Um, and um, the, uh, yeah, so that's Top Hat Star is another great tool that has been recently developed. Um, it's a lot faster. That's one of the biggest advantages uh, of using Star as an aligner. It's a lot faster than, than uh, Top Hat. Uh, but as I said, we'll get to use both. Uh, again, there are a lot of al other aligners. Uh, however, once you learn to use one tool, uh, you can take those skills and just apply them to any other tool out there. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, learning uh, the specific parameters that come with every tool. Um, should I use SpliceAware or Unsplice Napper? Um, again, so it's going back, we know that the, uh, the, the RNA that we have uh, does not contra contain uh, intronic regions, but if you plan to align it to a whole genome reference, then the whole genome reference is DNA, it contains um, uh, intron and exon, so you will have to deal with uh, or pick a tool that is splice aware. If you're aligning to transcriptomic reference, then you don't have to uh, pick a tool that is uh, splice aware. Now, Bowtie and Top Hat, um, the, the package is splice, splice aware aligner and uh, splice junction detector. So the way it works is uh, Bowtie is actually the backbone aligner for this, this package. Uh, Bowtie is great uh, at aligning short reads. However, the, the thing that Bowtie cannot do is it cannot deal with very large gaps. Those are the intronic gaps. And that's why Top Hat works like a wrapper. It uses bow tie as an aligner and it takes all that information from the alignment to uh, piece the information together and uh, create the splice junctions. And I'll go through an example of how it does it uh, st one step at a time. So let's take this as an example. Let's assume that we have two reads, read X and read Y. And uh, uh, this right here is the reference. So in this reference we have an exonic region, intronic region, and another exonic region. Exon 1, intron, exon 2. And uh, we're going to assume that the reads that we're dealing with, they are long enough that they could span multiple exons. Um, so read X, in this example, spans two exons, exon 1 and exon 2. But um, read X, again, as a reminder, it's a cDNA coming from mRNA, so there is no intronic region in, in, in that piece. Read Y, we can assume that it's a read that spans one exon. So the way it works, uh, top hats, well, Bowtie is going to try first and align all uh, the reads to the whole genome. And anything that perfectly maps, then it will put it in an aligned bin, or perfectly aligned bin. And anything that uh, partially maps, or partially unmaps, well, it depends what way you look at it, then it's going to put it in an unaligned bin. Because those reads, uh, there is a potential that they span multiple exons. So um, Top Hat will deal with, with those reads later. So Top Hat will take all the unaligned bins uh, from Bowtie and it will try to split the read into smaller segments. So it will take read X and split it, in this case, into three segments. 
and you get to decide how many uh, segments you want because you get to decide the length of each one of these segments. By default, it's 25, I believe. I don't know if that has changed. And then you take each one of these segments and then Bowtie will align, will do that alignment again. So it'll align it to the, the, the whole genome uh, again. And you'll notice now, previously, the, the, the read did not map, but when you break it down, the first piece will map the exon one. The second piece will still unmap because it's uh, it's a uh, exon exon boundary, and then the third piece will map. So Top Hat will collect that information from Bowtie, and it will try to estimate uh, a site where the splice junction is actually happening based on the mapping information of the small segments to the uh, to the whole genome. And it will do that for all the reads that did not map initially, and it will build some sort of an index of all the possible sites of splice junctions. And once it comes up with that list, it will take all the reads and align them again to the, the, the sites that it created, to the uh, slide library. And while it's doing that, it also looks at the coverage distribution um, uh, across uh, the, the different pieces and, uh, and to make sure that uh, it matches and, and, and so on. So is that process clear? The the alignment process and the spice detection questions. Okay. Sorry. I think I missed it. What happens to X two in this one? So um, the reason why it's doing that is it's it's trying to figure out where the splice junction is happening. So because X one aligned and X two and X two did not align, but X three aligned, it knows that the splice junction is between X one and X three. So it tries to estimate based on the mapping and unmapping information. Of these little segments. So we're not using X2 for anything? Well, you're using it to obtain uh, the splice uh, sites. Once you get the splice sites or the, the uh, predicted splice sites, you go back and align all the reads, the full read, not the chunks, to those splice sites to make to see if it actually is aligning uh, properly and if the uh, splice sites that they detected. Are, are proper. Yes. In case if uh, the X1 matches with multiple exons, like uh, uh, in that case, what happens with X1? This X1 is not, not matching with X1 one, or it's matching with X1 five. Uh, then in that case, will it be used or? Will it be yeah, I'm not sure how it deals with. Uh, I'm sure there is a filter for that for for uh, pieces that map to multiple locations. Also, like you. you there, there's a different way of assessing mismatches, I believe, depending on the location within the read. If it's at the beginning of the read, then it allows a certain number of mismatches, but if it's at the end of the read, then it allows more, just because um, the, the end of the read is known to have uh, prone to errors, technical errors, more than the beginning of the read. So I'm sure it deals with that aspect of, of multi-mapping. And you want to, you wanna, um, when you're deciding the length, and that's something we'll do in the integrated assignment, when you're saying the length of those segments, you don't want them to be extremely short that they get to a point where they're not unique anymore and they map to so many different places in the genome because that will introduce a lot of false uh, splice junctions in, in your data. Okay. Uh, it does the cycle once? So it does the cycle once, yes. So it does that for um, when we will run the alignment, you will see that it does it for uh, the read one and read two, and um, it, it does that once. And we'll look at the output while we're aligning, and I think the process will make more sense as you follow the log uh, while it's doing the alignment. Okay. Now, um, should I allow multi-mapping uh, in, in Top Hat or in RNA-seq? Now, uh, it really depends on the application. Uh, when you're dealing with DNA-seq, for example, oh, sorry, question. So for fusion, it's a different uh, algorithm. So, so this will fail. This, this happens to be a fusion rather than a splicing. This algorithm fails. Uh, you, you have to specify the, if you're looking for fusion, then the parameters that it uses, uh, and the thresholds for the expected distance changes. So here it's expecting, based on your library size, 
because you, you, you tell it the library size or tries to predict your library size. Um, so it has an expected distance between the two breakpoints. But uh, if you turn the fusion on, then the expected distance, the threshold will be increased, and then it will consider it to be a fusion. Sorry. So yeah, multi-mapping. Uh, when you're dealing with DNA seq, um, uh, that's a, a common thing that you'll encounter, where a read can map to multiple places. Um, and then, uh, depending on the tool you use, depending on what you want to do, sometimes uh, you can report all the, uh, the the reads that map to multiple places, and it will. Uh, the tool can pick either the randomly pick the the best alignment or pick the, the one with the highest uh, quality and sometimes there are multiple reads that map with the highest quality so you can randomly uh, pick one. Uh, with RNA-seq it really depends on what you are planning on doing. If you're planning on doing um, a variant calling then uh, uh, I would say perform the same thing as DNA and try to uh, uh, not allow multi-mapping. Um, if you're doing expression, you don't want to, uh, to, to influence the dynamic range of your expression, so it's recommended that maybe you keep the multi-mapping so that the, the reads can map to multiple, multiple places. And same with fusion, it's recommended that you would keep the multi-mapping. And um, that's an option that you, you will find in Top Hat. Uh, when we run the commands, you'll see, uh, you'll see there's an option that you can turn on and off. Now, once you run the alignment, what do you get out of it? You get a SAM uh, file. SAM stands for the Sequence Alignment uh, Map Format. Uh, a BAM file is simply the SAM file. A SAM file is just a text file, and the BAM file is a compressed version of a SAM file. And it's recommended that you keep the BAM version just because you're, you'll be saving space, uh, and you're not losing any information when you go from SAM to BAM. So uh, it's safe to just keep the BAM and get rid of the SAM uh, if, if, if you can. Now, uh, there are a lot of tools that you can use to convert SAM to BAM, BAM to SAM, and vice versa. Uh, one, of them, one of the ones that I use all the time is SAM tools. Uh, if you've heard of that, uh, I use that a lot to convert uh, back and forth. When you try to view uh, a BAM file, you can't just simply open the file because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's binary. So you're going to have to use a tool that will convert it uh, to SAM. Or uh, just like the Zcat uh, uh, version, you can stream the reads uh, and, and look at them. Um, however, that's not recommended because you will get millions and millions of reads, so you can't really browse through the, through the reads. Um, yes? How do the aligner, aligners handle SNPs? So as I said, so it allows for uh, mismatches. It does. Okay. It does, and then the rate of mismatches differ depending on where uh, in the read it is. So at the beginning of the read, the rate is a bit lower than at the end of the read, just because of that. I'll show you when you look at the QC, the quality of the bases in the read drops towards the end. So it it, it allows for for that. It's flexible that way. And you can change the number of mismatches if you want. If you want to be more strict, then you can change that as well when you're doing the alignment. Settings tend to be fairly permissive, though, so they will tolerate even within a single read. You could have several polymorphisms in your individual, and it won't prevent that read from aligning to the correct yeah. read in the genome. Um, so, if you haven't seen a SAM uh, or a BAM file, this is what it looks like. Uh, you can break it down into two sections. So, you have the header at the top, and uh, you have the the body. The header contains information. Uh, about uh, the, 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 the sequencer. I'll get into uh, uh, the details of what the header actually includes in a bit. Uh, but the body contains the actual sequences that you have aligned. So all these sequences are, um, are the same sequences that you found in, uh, in, in the FASTQ file. So, uh, and then it just it's adding another layer of information. It's telling you it's that sequence in the FASTQ file, but I'm telling you where it actually aligned and the quality of the alignment as well. So you can pretty much take the BAM file as well and then convert it to FASTQ because all the sequences should be there, aligned and unaligned. Um, I talked, I've talked about that. Uh, and BAM file, uh, uh, BAM files actually, you can actually index the BAM files as well, and that will uh, make the retrieval of sequences uh, a lot faster. If you want to pull a specific uh, read coming from a specific position, uh, you will have to index the BAM file to be able to pull those reads uh, pretty quickly. 
so this is the header section I was talking about. What kind of information does it contain? Um, so uh, the, the tags, such at HD, for example, it looks at the, uh, the version of the BAM file. It looks at the sorting order. So how is this BAM file sorted? Is it sorted according to position or sorted according to the reads uh, within the BAM? It also looks at the reference that was used to perform the alignment, what version of a reference was used, uh, this, the, the contigs and the, their length, um, and the species as well. Uh, read group, um, so the, uh, the library identifier, so uh, it's all information that will help you. If you read the header, you should be able to go back and reprocess the data based on that information. Uh, so it'll tell you the library, it'll tell you the sequencing center, uh, what type of sequencer was used, and uh, the sample the sample name. And finally, the program that was used to perform the alignment, and sometimes you get even like a command, the actual command that was used to get the, uh, the, the alignment. And the, the richer the header is, the easier it will be for someone to reprocess the data without asking you questions or, uh, or asking the person who sent the BAM file any questions. Now, um, now, the body of the BAM file c contains uh, uh, a list of information. So uh, I'm not sure if you can see uh, the bottom. So I'm just going to go through an example of, of, uh, of tags that you can find in the alignment. So for each one of these sequences that are aligned, you'll get information such as uh, the uh, uh, Q name. So that's the, the template name. It contains the read name and it appends to it the, sequen the sequencing information. And it tells you whether it's read one or read two. Um, you have the flag. So the ones that are highlighted, uh, we'll get into, uh, I'll, I'll explain them in, in details in a bit. The flag and the cigar. These are the two that I'll explain in a bit. Uh, uh, um, R name, so it tells you the chromosome that the reads align to, the position within that chromosome, also the mapping quality, and the it will look at the pair, the read 2. It will tell you where, what chromosome read 2 aligned to, and what position of read 2, and how far is read 2 from read 1. So that information can help you come up with an insert size distribution. So you, uh, you can find the distribution of the, the size of the fragments that the, the libraries came from. Um, and then you get the actual sequence, and then another string for the quality. So for each base, you'll get the quality. Um, um, quality score, just like uh, was discussed above, uh, b before with the FASTQ files. So what's this uh, flag um, that I've, I've shown you earlier? So this is a, a 12 uh, bitwise flag. Uh, it helps you, it, it describes the alignment. So they're trying to pack as much information about the alignment in, in this score. And um, this score is um, you can think of it as a, as a combination. It's a number from 1, 000, 1 to 2048, but it is um, represented in uh, a hexadecimal representation. So it's a, it's a make, it makes it a bit confusing. Um, but each number represents a, a type of or a type of quality for that alignment. So it will tell you if the template has uh, multiple segments or multiple uh, alignments, if it will tell you if the segment actually mapped or it didn't map, um, if it fairly, uh, if it was a proper pair, if the second read actually mapped as well on the same chromosome, uh, it will classify it as a proper pair. Um, if it's the first read or the second read, um, if it's a primary alignment or a secondary alignment, and if it passes uh, filters, if it's a PCR artifact, um, and it, or if it's a supplementary alignment. So uh, the, we can use this, uh, these flags. If you use SAM tools, for example, you can use SAM tools and use that flag to pull all the reads that are coming from proper pairs. So you just provide, you don't need to provide anything, you just provide that flag that's associated with the description. And it will pull all the reads from that BAM file that are coming from uh, proper pairs. It will pull all the reads that are coming from the first read, not the second read. So it just makes the retrieval of the reads from the BAM file a lot, a lot easier. And um, the cigar string is a string that's also in the BAM file, and that string is so each read gets a cigar string, and the cigar string um, uh, ex uh, explains the um, it describes the actual alignment. Uh, the breakdown of the alignment. So if we uh, take a look at this uh, uh, as an example, so 
saying 81M, 859N, 19M. So what does that mean? This means that um, there are 81 bases in that read that matched. Then there were 859 gaps or bases that were gaps, and then 19 bases matched. So the 100 uh, bases read, the first chunk of it uh, matched an exon, and then there was a big, a large intronic region, and then another uh, exonic region. So by reading this cigar string, it will help you visualize uh, the, the read and where, where it aligned. And that's what actually uh, uh, BAM viewers or alignment viewers use. They pull the cigar string and then they, they, uh, they use that information to help you visualize uh, the read and how the, the, what the breakdown of the read is. So you had a question. Yeah, what's secondary alignment? Um, secondary alignment, as I mentioned, if you have multiple, um, if the read aligns to multiple places, and the primary alignment would be the, the, the best alignment, and then if there are other locations for that alignment that are less quality, then that would be considered the secondary alignment. Yes. On, on the flag, on your example, it says 99. How do I interpret that 99 given that your code, the address? Uh, Sorry? Yes, what? Yeah, so on the previous slide, on, on the example, oh. it says 90. You see that 99. Oh, this one right here? Yeah, for flag. But then on your next slide, there is no 99. Oh, so it could be a combination of, of uh, so not, not one. So 99 is, will probably be a combination of different uh, qualities. So there is a, a website that I usually, uh, I usually uh, like to show. So let's try and look for it. Where you can put the number and it will break it down for you and it will tell you uh, what that means, what combination of metrics that actually represents. Because it could be like a first read and it could be properly paired and it could be past quality and they com combined uh, it is a, a score. Uh, let's see if we can find. Cigar. Because it's kind of impossible for. Um... Oh, there you go. So this website is provided by them. So you put the flag, in this case is 99, and it will tell you what combination of metrics it's uh, actually coming from. So all I needed to do, you don't have to put the whole link, I, all I did is I searched uh, Cigar Flags Explained. Um, and this is by Picard. So you can go here and if you're interested in uh, a combination of filters, you can check all of them. So you can do the opposite. You can check the filters that you're interested in and the numbers will change. Then you take that number and you go to SAM Tools and you do SAM Tools View, you specify the, the, the flag that you're interested in, and uh, it will subset the file. And when you're subsetting the file, you can either include, make an inclusive list or exclusive list. So you can say, I only want reads that fit these criteria, or I want all the reads that are um, they don't fit this criteria, uh, and so on. So there's so many different ways you can subset a BAM file. Let's go back. Okay, so we talked about the cigar uh, cigar string. Um, the bed file is uh, another format that is uh, um, important when you're trying to subset uh, a BAM file. So a bed file is a text file that contains um, a few columns. It has the chromosome, uh, start, end, and whatever feature you're interested in. So let's think of, uh, let's, let's use an example. So let's say you are, wanted to pull a specific gene from your BAM file. So in the bed, you can say uh, the gene has this chromosome, is on this chromosome, has this start, this end, and this is the gene name. So you can use the bed file as a way to intersect the bed with the BAM. So you, you, there are tools that will take the bed file that has the gene information, gene boundaries, and the BAM file that has the alignment and you tell it, okay, take these boundaries and overlap them with the alignment and pull the alignments that overlap this specific gene, just these boundaries. And you, it doesn't have to be a gene, it could be anything you want, a region in the genome, a band, wh whatever you want, as long as it has chromosome, start, end, and a, and a name, uh, 
uh, that's a bed file and you can use it to intersect with a bad file. And you can actually intersect two bed files as well if you want. Uh, it doesn't have to be a bad, a bed and a bam. Um, so this is just a list of some of the tools that you can use to uh, manipulate the BAM file or find intersection with the, uh, the bed. So SAM tools, as I've mentioned, I use that a lot. You can use BAM tools, you can use Picard. Uh, for bed files, you can use bed tools or uh, bed, bed ops. Uh, now, to, for me, I mainly use uh, SAM tools and, and bed tools. Bed tools is um, very, very useful, at, uh, especially when, it, when you're looking at coverages, for example, because you can do that. Um, uh, if you pull the, if you want to pull the raw number of reads that cover a specific region, you can use bed tools. Um, how should you sort your alignments? There are two ways that you can sort your alignments. You can do it either at the um, uh, by position, and um, and this is mainly for performance reasons, so that the uh, whatever uh, tool that you're using downstream uh, will will. Um, Will, will have an easier time to retrieve uh, the, the reads if it's looking uh, for them by position. You can also sort the, the BAM file by read name and uh, the intention behind doing it that way, uh, sometimes for example if you're looking for fusions, you want to find out if the first read uh, is, is mapping to a chromosome and the second read is mapping to a, a different chromosome and you want the reads to be right next to each other. So when you're doing the check, you can just uh, uh, check quickly. Um, and there are other tools that you can use also for sorting the BAM, your, your BAM file. Now, um, IGV is one way that you can use to visualize your alignment. And I believe, any, has anyone ever used IGV before? Oh, okay, that's great. Um, so you can uh, simply just load the BAM file in IGV. And uh, what, how, the way it works is that you get this window where you have the uh, ideogram, so that's like the, the chromosome, uh, the P arm, the Q arm in the chromosome, along with the bands, you have the, cent the centromere. Um, and in the bottom, you can load uh, a gene track, so that um, for, for a specific gene, uh, it will tell you the exonic and intronic uh, regions. You can change the gene track, you can add whatever annotation that you have or you choose uh, uh, to use. Um, and then you get the, the reads. So this is a pileup of the reads that uh, you have sequenced, and um, the uh, this just uh, this plot right right here shows you the distribution of the coverage um, for the uh, uh, exonic islands that you have. The lines that connect these uh, red fragments uh, they represent the intronic regions that the uh, aligner or top hat uh, predicted uh, based on the reads that you have. So what you try to do is you, you try to look at the predicted splice junction, which are these blue lines, light blue lines, and then you compare them to the uh, known annotation to see if the islands of exons and introns match. Uh, and and they, they should uh, most of the time match unless you are dealing with novel genes uh, where you have, your, you have novel splice junctions that might not be annotated in the database. Uh, but most of the time, the, uh, the, the splice junctions that you detect are probably known and they should match uh, the uh, transcripts at the bottom of the screen. Now you can color code the reads as well. Uh, you can color code them to tell you whether they're coming from the first read or the second read. If you're doing strand specific uh, libraries, then the color coding is very important because it tells you whether it's coming from the sense or anti-sense. Uh, so it adds uh, another layer of information that can be useful. And you can look at the color of the reads, and you can look at the direction of the uh, transcription. Uh, you look at the arrow, and, and that will tell you whether it's coming from the sense or antisense, and if that direction actually matches the color of your reads, if they're coming from the same, the same strand. Um, so here are some other alternatives to IGV. I personally haven't used any other uh, visualization other than uh, IGV. And um, I just use it, I don't know, like I don't, it's really hard to, uh, to uh, pick a region because the, the transcriptome is so huge. Unless you're interested in a specific gene, if you're doing targeted uh, panel, 
or uh, after you actually do differential expression and then you find a list, a small uh, list of genes that you're interested in, then you'd go back and just make sure that the coverage is okay uh, in these two. Otherwise, it's really hard to assess the whole transcriptome using IGV. It will just take forever and it's just not efficient, not an efficient way of, of, of assessing QC. And that's why uh, you should use tools to assess the QC for you. And here is just a list of uh, metrics that you can look at to assess the QC of your uh, alignments. And I'll go through each one of these metrics and I'll show you uh, a plot that you can generate to help you understand each one of these metrics. Uh, so we're going to be looking at uh, the, the coverage bias, we're looking at the nucleotide content distribution, uh, the base quality, the read quality distribution, um, if there are any PCR artifacts, uh, the depth, the sequencing depth, and how to determine how deep uh, should you go when it comes to sequencing. Uh, you can look at the base distribution and finally the insert size uh, distribution. Now, all of these uh, plots that I'm going to show you uh, today, they are coming from one tool called uh, RCC. Um, you are not uh, uh, obligated to use that tool. You can go ahead and use whatever tool you want. These are just some guidelines of things or metrics that you can look at. Um, you can establish, you can write your own script to pull these metrics, uh, or you can use a combination of other uh, uh, tools. I believe Picard has a very nice tool uh, for RNA-seq, collect RNA-seq metrics, I think that's what it's called. Um, so you can, ideally you would like to combine multiple tools when you're developing a pipeline for your QC, but this is just a good starting point uh, for, for QC. So the, the first uh, thing, the first metric that we'll look at is the three prime and five prime bias, or um, uh, you can think of it as coverage uniformity. So you want to look at the transcript and you want to make sure that the coverage across the transcript is uniform, that both ends of the transcript are being covered uh, the same way. Now, um, to, to, in order to calculate that, what RCC does, because the transcripts, they have different lengths, so it takes all the transcripts and then it splits them into quantiles or bins uh, from 1 to 100. And it looks at the coverage for each one of these bins and that will help you uh, visualize. So if you plot on the, on the right, we're looking at a plot where uh, the, the x-axis represent the quantiles from 0 to 100, or you can think of them as bins from 0 to 100, and then uh, the y-axis is the coverage. And you, once you do the plot, you realize that there are two groups of samples. So there is a group of samples that seem to have uh, consistent coverage uh, across all the bins, from the 5 end to the 3 end of the transcript. But you see a group of uh, samples that seem to have a lot more coverage on the 3 end compared to the 5 end. Now, um, this is alarming because it could mean multiple things. It could mean that the transcript is actually, or your RNA is degraded, um, the, the five end uh, has very low coverage compared to the three end. So if that's the case, you want to go back and check your RIN number and see if it's low or if it's high. Um, it could also mean that there is a, a three prime bias, maybe the kit that you use, maybe it's poly A selection. If you're doing poly A, then uh, you're only pulling things that have a, 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 from the, the three prime end. Um, so if that's the case, you want to go back and then maybe look at assessing the library uh, selection that you, you've done, choose another one, or so on. Um, if you don't adjust for these differences, they will uh, actually have some bad consequences and when it comes to expression estimation. Because if you have bias in your uh, coverage, you will end up underestimating or overestimating your expression, um, uh, depending on how severe uh, the bias is. Now there are methods, computational methods, where you can correct for, for these. Uh, if you absolutely cannot obtain new samples or you can't uh, rerun those uh, uh, lanes, then you can correct for them, but you have to be aware of them and, and figure out why and then correct uh, for it before you perform expression estimation. Got a question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you how. How you can correct for them? Yeah. Yeah. Unless yeah. I don't. I don't have a specific tool uh, at the top of my head uh, that I'm aware of. But uh, I guess it really depends on the severity. Like if all your samples have that, um, uh, or if you've done two groups and one group does, maybe you can use that as a benchmark to normalize and try to 
correct the, the, the distribution based on the other group that doesn't have that artifact. But at the end of the day, if you're using it downstream, you will, you will see the, the byproduct of this bias uh, somewhere unless you adjust for it in your downstream analysis. Um, so I'm not sure how uh, good the tools are at, at, at correcting um, uh, those. Uh, ideally, you would like to rerun um, uh, the, the sample because it could be that you're, you're missing out on other, if it's a poly A selection problem, then maybe you're missing out on reads that are not here. So even if you correct for them, the reads that are not there or transcripts that are not there, uh, that the, fa the false, false negatives. Yes. In which script you have the one that is biased towards the right? Yeah. Is that a three prime or five prime? That's a three prime. So you go from five to three. Uh, it's five to three, I believe. Five to three. Yes. But uh, when you are doing the expression count, it's read counts for the genes. Yeah. So if the uh, read aligns, you have the coverage over the entire RNA, yeah. or you have a coverage over at the end of the RNA, yeah. the counting should not change, right? The counting should not change. What do you mean? I mean, the, the counting should be distributed across all the exons within, so there shouldn't be a bias towards one end or the other. Yeah. So you are counting the reads which are aligned to one set of genes. To, yes. To the gene. Yes. So if it aligns at the five prime end or it aligns to the three prime end, the count should be the same, right? So it should not affect much in a downstream analysis. If you are doing gene expression analysis, if you have this sort of sample, but why are they not aligning to the three prime? Like you're saying, if it's biasing towards one end, that's okay because the count is still there. Yeah. But the count should be distributed evenly, because what if you are, if there is a, a degradation in your in your uh, in your RNA, then you're biasing towards the the short reads or the short transcripts. Their expression will be higher than long transcripts. <coughs> depending on how severe the bias is. So for short transcript, if there's more counts on the five prime end, or sorry, the three prime end, uh, that's overestimating the expression versus very long transcripts where they'll have um, a lot of reads on the, on the three prime, but there's nothing on the, uh, three, the, the five prime end. It, it can be okay for just gene expression analysis if the bias is consistent across all your samples. Yeah. And sometimes it is. Like you said, you get a count. Yes, you don't have even, even coverage across the transcript, but the count near the three prime end can be a decent proxy for the gene overall. But if it is a problem if it's inconsistent across your sample set, that can happen if the bias is, is being caused by some kind of degradation, and then that might be bad in one sample, and might be not so bad in another sample. And usually when you see this pattern, And you can't guarantee at the selection process if you've missed any. It's a sign that you might have missed. And that you can't really correct for because you can't you didn't really pick it up you if there was know, degraded if it's like yeah. generated the data, aligned it to no transcripts yeah. and seen its bias. It can also be caused by I suppose like problems during CDNA synthesis where you're priming off of poly A tail and doing a reverse transcript based reaction and somehow there's some inconsistency in that or not getting So let me give you to redo the sequencing or can can it be rectified for maybe for the downstream analysis or it needs to be done? Well as as I say you need to figure out where it's actually happening. Like if you can go back and check your RIN or like uh, the library quality to see if it was good or bad. If it was really good then it's a sign that it wasn't maybe the library, it was something that happened after the library construction. Um, so try to trace back the error and see where you can produce a plot like this and if you see a mix of different patterns it's bad. Yeah. If they're all the same and it doesn't look that great, it's a, it's not ideal, but it's probably okay. Yeah. Sure if they have a quite consistent pattern, like if you 
had one of those two sets, either the one that's kind of like a horseback or the other one that's sort of like biased to the right, and he didn't think he could, if they were all like one or the other, it would be okay. Yeah. He wouldn't want to see a mix like that. Most of the time when I've seen this, it was an indication of a kit. It was just a, the kit that was used. Um, it was a reproducible error because of the kit that was used, so kit differences. Um, was there a scenario like uh, have you observed something like there is a peak in the right hand, a peak in the right hand, but in between there is a sound in the left hand? Is it possible? Or? It's probably possible to make a library that's like that somehow. And there are probably techniques that actually. If the Rebel depletion is good, you should get a pretty even, it shouldn't bias you towards one end of the transcript. So you should get it. Yeah, some, but I don't know that you would see that. Unless it's degraded. Um, another uh, metric that you can look at is the uh, nucleotide uh, content. So here I'm looking at the position uh, within a read. So uh, assume that our read is uh, 35 base long, very short read. And then we're looking at the nucleotide frequency at each position across all the reads uh, in, your, in your library. And uh, what you expect is that you expect um, uh, 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 the, the same distribution, so A, C, G, T to be about 25% uh, uh, presentation in your uh, in your pool. Um, however, when you, we do this for some of the Illumina samples, um, you notice that there is a deviation uh, from the expected 25% uh, at the beginning uh, of the read, and uh, it seems that it's the it's it's due to random pri prim primers. Uh, that do the reverse trans uh, that reverse transcribe RNA fragments into cDNA or double stranded uh, cDNA. Uh, they seem to cause uh, they seem to be not very random and they cause some certain patterns um, over uh, the first few bases of the of the read. Now um, this does slightly affect the uh, alignment. Um, so one way you can improved alignment is by uh, trimming or trying to uh, adjust for those uh, changes. I usually just trim the first bases of the read um, and then uh, and use so they use the, re the rest of the read that has uh, ACGT of about 25 25%. Um, yes. Can you say it's always the beginning of the read. Beginning of the read. Yeah. How many bases? How many bases? Sorry, how many bases? Uh, between zero and ten. Yeah. Are there any biases in G see much variation because of that in these sorts of graphs. I wouldn't think so, no. There's a lot of complexity across the whole gene space. So I don't think you can see that. Yeah. 
but before you trim, like do do the plot, uh, see if you have such um, distribution, and if you do, then I'll uh, try to uh, fix it. Oh yes. Is this RC? RC C. Yes. RC yes. the same as the RNA C C from Robin Studio? No. This is different, yeah, yeah. So there are multiple tools. Uh, there's that. There's also the the card collect RNA seq metrics, um, and they and they don't all, all overlap in terms of the QC. So each tool would have some unique metrics and plus. So that's why I said uh, the union of all of these tools would be uh, great if you can run all of them and then. Um, another metric you can look at is you can look at the, um, the distribution of the, the base distri distribution uh, across the reads. So here we're looking at the same, uh, the same reads, 35 bases long, and we're looking at each base and we're looking at distribution of the quality. The quality is usually reported as a FRED score, and a FRED score is just the probability that the base calling is wrong. So uh, a FRED score, if you see a FRED score of 30 or Q30 means there's one in a thousand chance that this uh, uh, base calling is, is wrong. So the higher the Q score, the better uh, the, the quality uh, of, the, of the base because it's less likely that it's, uh, it's an error. Um, you notice that, so here most of the reads are, uh, most of the bases are above uh, Q30, which is great. You do uh, uh, realize that there, uh, you notice there is a decline uh, in the in the quality. Uh, that's okay because that's just an expen expected um, for all the sequences by the synthesis technique that the error profile increases as uh, you go towards the end of the read. Uh, just make sure that the uh, overall distribution of your reads are above uh, Q30. Um, the uh, another uh, metric that we look at um, is uh, PCR uh, duplication. So in DNA, uh, I don't know. You guys didn't touch upon PCR. Did you talk about the collapsing, collapsing your data? So in DNA, you collapse the data because uh, the, some of the reads can be PCR artifacts. So you expect the reads in your genome to uh, overlap. You don't expect them to pile up in uh, one region. That's when we talk about DNA. When we talk about RNA, things are a bit different because um, the, uh, the start positions in the RNA, they're not random. They're, the genes, they have a start, a, a transcription site where they start. So there is a likelihood that you will see reads that pile up at a certain uh, position. So you can't, can't really differentiate between a PCR artifact and a, a true biological transcription signal. Um, so um, I usually don't do collapsing when it comes to RNA. Uh, however, if you want to assess um, uh, the, the duplication rate, there are various ways you can do that. So one way that R60 does it, it looks at the sequences, and it looks at the sequences uh, for both uh, reads, read one and read two, and it looks at the position, so they must have the first start point for read one and end for read two. It also looks at the sequence context. If the sequence uh, uh, content is exactly the same, then it calculates the duplication rate based on the sequence content and based on the start and end, and it will give you an estimation uh, of that. And based on that, it's up to you. If you, if you see a very high level of duplication, uh, then you can go back and check why uh, this might be happening. Is it the library prep? Uh, and then you get to choose whether or not you want to collapse and, and check the dynamic range of your expression after and before collapsing. Uh, to make sure that it doesn't change massively. Um, sequencing uh, depth. So if you're trying to figure out um, how many lanes of sequencing you want to do for your study, how many samples you want to uh, 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 multiplex in, you, in one lane, uh, again, that question is dependent on so many things. It depends on what kind of uh, sequencing you're doing. Uh, are you doing total RNA? Are you doing poly selection? Um, uh, what kind of analysis do you want to do downstream? Are you just doing variant uh, calling from RNA? Are you doing expression estimation? Are you doing uh, fusion? So there are a lot of uh, variables that you have to consider when you're trying to decide how many reads per sample. But one simple way can be uh, by doing a pilot experiment where you do, we take one of your samples and then run a full lane uh, on it. 
and then do um, uh, a saturation uh, uh, experiment or a saturation test. So what the tool does, it takes the aligned band file and it samples at different levels. So it samples 10% of the reads randomly, 20%, 30%, 40%, up to 100%. And at each sampling um, a level, it calculates the number of novel junctions and known junctions based on uh, a database that you provide or like a, t a file that you provide. So it goes through them and then calculates the number of known and novel junctions. And then it comes up with this plot. So the point where you want to stop sequencing is the point where the, your total junctions have saturated. So no matter how many reads you're adding, you're not actually getting any more uh, information. You're not getting any more junctions. Now you notice here there are three curves. So uh, the blue one represents all junctions. The red one represents the uh, known junctions and the green one represents the novel junctions. And you will notice that the first one that saturates is the um, known junctions. And that's because um, there are a lot of false positive uh, junctions that you'll get uh, with whatever tool you're, you're trying to do. You will get false positive junctions. They're novel junctions. Um, so it, you can consider both the novel and known and try to come up with uh, a threshold at which you're not getting any more uh, junctions. Now you can do the same thing. That's not an RCC, but you can also look at maybe the expression of uh, gene families. So you do the same sampling experiment and see uh, how many more genes are you picking up? How many genes are you uh, picking up by adding more reads? And at a point at which you saturate where you're not introducing any new uh, genes or that the expression doesn't change, uh, then maybe that's the point uh, you can stop. Um, and that will give you an idea of how much sequencing you need to do. And then you can go back and run that on the rest of your samples. Um, base distribution, so what this is doing is just taking the bases that have been aligned and it's trying to figure out where uh, in the transcriptome those bases are aligning. Are they in the intronic region, exonic region, um, intergenic region, and so on. And uh, that will confirm the type of library that you've used. If you use total RNA, you'll uh, obviously see more intergenic regions. If you use poly A selection, then you should see a lot more coding or exonic uh, bases um, and if there is uh, any discrepancy, you, know, you want to go back and, and check why. Um, uh, you can also look at the insert size distribution. So um, you have uh, your, your fragment is what you're trying to sequence. This is the fragment of cDNA. Uh, you attach the adapters uh, to it before you sequence it. So when we talk about insert size, we're talking about the, uh, the, the fragment without the adapter sequences. Uh, when you're talking about the inner distance, that's the uh, distance between the two reads. So if this is your cDNA fragment, you're trying to sequence uh, read one. So that would be like 100 bases this way, 100 bases this way. Whatever is left uh, of, uh, that hasn't been sequenced from that fragment is called the inner mate or inner distance. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because we'll use that metric in uh, the integrated assignment in a bit. So you keep that in mind when uh, we're, we're doing that. But you can use that information, as I've mentioned, in this. From, you can pull it from the cigar string. Uh, or you, um, sorry, you can pull it from the, the, there's a column that has the distance from read one to read two. Um, and that information can help you come up with an insert size distribution. So that will approximate the fragment uh, size of the library that you started with. And then you can check it against what was reported or what you were told and see if the library size uh, uh, matches or, uh, or not. Um, and I believe also you can also use IGV. If you have a specific gene in mind, a specific site uh, in mind, you can load your data in IGV. And if you're looking for specific variants, you can, um, uh, the, 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 the variants or the uh, SNPs, they will be colored. If any, any base that does not match the reference will be uh, colored, so you can look at that. And if you want to calculate the allele frequency, you simply just count the uh, number of reads that have a, uh, a different uh, base over the total number of reads that cover that site, and that will give you the allele frequency uh, for that variant that you're interested in. 
Uh, however, this is just if you know what gene you're interested in, what exon. Um, uh, ideally, what you want to do is some sort of variant calling tool, or you can do SAM tools pile up that goes through every single base in your genome, and it does that for you. It calculates the number of bases that match the reference, number of bases that, uh, that are alternate, and it will calculate that frequency uh, for you at each site. Okay, so that concludes the uh, second module.